We've been spending some time this summer <clears throat> thinking about the questions Jesus asked. And so this morning we're continuing in that. And I, I don't know about you, but as I've been going through this and as I've been looking at questions and passages, the thing that's probably stood out to me as much as anything is the fact that until you know the rest of the story, the questions don't often, and they don't often make as much sense as I think Christ intended them to. You see, he didn't just give a question at random in a vacuum. They're, they're, they're kind of like, in a sense, the punchline to a joke. Right? Without the punchline, the joke doesn't make sense. But without the joke, the punchline just kind of hangs there, not really being all that understandable. And the same is true with the questions Jesus asked. They are interesting and brilliant questions, but until you know the situation, the stories going on, the rest of the teaching surrounding it, I don't think the full brilliance and glory of what Jesus is saying comes to the forefront. And so this morning, just like we've been doing all along, we're going to try to get to, uh, get to the whole big picture of the story in order that we understand the question Jesus asked in verse 5 of Matthew chapter 9 when he turns and says, which is harder to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? And we're going to get there, but uh, before we do that, we need to just kind of step back a little bit from the scene. Because Matthew's, he's trying to teach us something. He, he's going to tell similar stories to Mark and to Luke, but he, interesting enough, he tells them in different order. If you were to go to Mark and get to chapter 2 of Mark, you would come across the exact same story we're going to be looking at in Matthew chapter 9. You'd find it in, in Luke chapter 5 as well, but in those passages, you're going to find it in chronological order. Meaning, you're going to find it in the order of events by which they happen in the life of Jesus. Matthew sets aside chronology... Because he's putting the stories in order to teach us something about who Jesus is. And it's like he's building sort of this ascending momentum of the authority of Jesus Christ. So if you go back to chapter 7 of Matthew, he ends this incredible teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount with this observation that the people, they heard in Jesus an authority that they had never heard elsewhere. There was something about the way he spoke, the way he taught that was unique, that set him apart from any of their other religious leaders or teachers. By the end of Matthew in chapter 8, it's Jesus himself who makes the incredible statement, all authority in heaven and on earth is mine. And what I want to suggest to you this morning is that, that Matthew is telling the story of Jesus so that we understand the full spectrum and glory of the authority of Jesus Christ. He, he begins back in the early parts of chapter 8 by talking about Jesus healing some marginalized type people. He, he heals a leper. He heals him. He touches him. He then moves on. He heals the daughter of a centurion. He heals someone who is, who is ethnically different. He moves on then and he heals the, the mother-in-law of Peter. He crosses gender lines. And I think what, what Matthew is showing us is Jesus crossing all of these lines and boundaries that, that most people would not have expected the Messiah to cross. And yet Matthew just shows us one after the other. We get to the middle part of chapter 8. We find him delivering a man from a demon. And then we, we reach this point of Jesus not only being able to have authority to heal and to cleanse, he has authority to stop storms. And Matthew shows us his authority over nature itself. But I think the pinnacle moment comes in the early verses of chapter 9. Because he has authority to heal and cast out demons and calm storms. But the greatest authority possible comes to us in chapter 9, verse 1 to 8, where Jesus claims to have the authority to forgive sins. And our faith, the Christian message, is all about this. In fact, if you want to know what is distinctive about what we believe, it is a message that God made possible for forgiveness for sins because there's no other way. And it comes to us, we stare it right in the face here in chapter 9 of Matthew. Now, like I said, if we were to turn to, to Mark and to Luke, they're going to tell the same stories, and they actually include other detail. So it, it, 
I remember growing up in church, learning this story from like Mark and Luke's version because of the other details. It creates a much better story to teach kids. The details of the four friends coming with their, their lame friend, of, of arriving at a house that's full of people. And Matthew only hints at it in verse 1. We find out that Jesus got into a boat. He's just healed him. He, sorry, delivered a man from demon possession. He crossed over, Matthew tells us. He came to his own city. So just so we are aware of what Matthew's talking about, <clears throat> he's not talking about Bethlehem, which we might presume to be his own city. That's the city where he was born. And, and we might tend to think in those terms. After all, if someone comes to you and says, well, where are you from? Probably the answer is going to be the town you were born in, but if you're, if you're like me and it was a place you were born but you weren't really raised, you might say something like, well, I was born in Campbell River, but you know what's coming next, right? There's, there's sort of a but. There's a, an extra piece of information because we moved when I was pretty young, so to say that's where I'm from, I'm not sure we'd quite say that. So Jesus, in the same way, was born in Bethlehem, but to say that's where he's from isn't quite accurate because he was really raised in the town of Nazareth. But, but here's the tricky thing of, of chapter 9, verse 1. That's not the city either. Because fairly early on in the ministry of Jesus, he returns to his hometown. And his hometown rejects him. In fact, not only do they reject him, they, they want to put him to death for the claims he's making. And so he, he adopts a new hometown, a fishing village on the shore of the Sea of Galilee called Capernaum. It's actually the home to one of the, the pretty predominant disciples, a man named Peter. In fact, by the time we arrive in chapter 9, verse 1, there's a reasonable chance that we're actually in Peter's house. And crowds of people have been coming to hear Jesus. They're attracted by the miracles and by the teachings. And by the time we arrive at this story, as Mark and Luke tell it, there is such a massive crowd of people packed into this house that there is no chance that anyone else is going to be able to get through the door and get to Jesus. And hence we have our story of four friends who are so convinced of the power that Jesus has to be able to help their friend that they go up on the roof and they cut a hole through the roof of this house to lower their friend into the presence of Jesus. Now, I remember, I, I've got one of these, one of these kind of ways of picture. I just remember as a kid loving this story. I could just picture it so vividly. And, uh, and maybe you have too. Maybe, you know, you're, thinking, you're sitting here right now. It's like, hold on a second. If someone came over to my house and started getting a hole through my roof, we've got a problem. I mean, that's always how I would picture it. It's like, well, what did they do? I mean, surely there was the moments where Jesus is starting to teach and he's probably in there teaching people. And then there was probably those moments where people started noticing little bits of stuff falling. This is kind of how I have it pictured, stuff falling from the roof. And it's probably like a Sunday. We have, every once in a while have one of those moments where like numbers start flashing up on the kids' board, right? And I'm here, so I can't quite see it, but I see you all looking up there. Or there's a wasp flying around every once in a while and everyone's like doing this. But you're trying to pay attention, Right? You're trying to not let on that you're massively distracted. But that's how I have it pictured in my mind in this scene. Jesus is he's teaching, and everyone's kind of doing this. They're trying to pretend they don't see stuff falling. But then there's this point where it's just got to stop. Like You start to see hands come through and rocks and stuff. And surely at some point they just sort of step back and go, hold on a second. Something very unusual is happening. And I don't know how long it took for these guys to get the hole through the roof. I've done some demolition work. I know it's not like an instantaneous thing to cut a roof, you know, apart. I'm picturing, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, half an hour maybe, as stuff's starting to fall in until there's finally a hole big enough that they lower their friend down by ropes. Uh, at least that's how I've always pictured it. I don't think they just dropped him in. They lowered him down right in front of Jesus. And the interesting thing is Matthew tells the story is no one has said a word. The friends haven't called down, hey Jesus, we're lowering our friend down. Could you help him? The, the man on the mat hasn't said a word. The crowd hasn't said a word. In fact, the first one to speak will be Jesus. And so here's how we're going to sort of deal with this passage this morning. There's going to be four points and then one kind of response at the end. So here are the four points. Number one, we're going to look at something that Jesus saw. Then we're going to look at something that Jesus said. Then we're going to look at something Jesus knew and then something Jesus asked. 
and then we'll consider a response. You see, as they're lowering the man down, Matthew tells us in verse 2 that we're to behold this. So this is Matthew's famous word for pay very careful attention because you're likely to miss this. So anytime Matthew says behold, that, that's a clue. It's like I am prone to miss something very important that's happening here. But Matthew says in verse 2, behold, some people brought to Jesus a paralytic lying on a bed and when Jesus saw their faith, dot, 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 hold that, second for, hold that thought for a second. Because the first thing we need to realize is that Jesus saw something. He saw faith. Now, that's a strange little comment, really, because faith to me seems like one of those intangible kind of things that's, that's not really a visible seeing type of thing. It's something that is inside of it. It's this conviction that Jesus is who he claims to be and does what he claims to have done. And when the day comes where you arrive at the point where you just are absolutely convinced and you know it inside beyond a shadow of a doubt, that's faith. But how do you see it? In my, my mind's eye, I picture it kind of like, like an iceberg. Right, most of the iceberg is there under the waterline. This huge, massive thing. And if you just sort of look, you don't see it. But, but then there's this little piece that pokes up above the water. And I think in the analogy, the little pieces are the, the actions that flow out of these rock-solid internal convictions of who Jesus is and what truth is. And what Jesus saw was a little bit of an iceberg poking above the water. You see, I think these men woke up that morning fully convinced that Jesus could heal. But if you saw them get out of bed, you wouldn't have seen a thing. And I think they were fully convinced when they hatched the plan of what they were going to do. But if you looked at it as an outsider, you wouldn't have seen much. And they were fully convinced when they were carrying this guy along, I picture one on each corner carrying the bed towards the house, fully convinced. But if you watched that, it didn't look like faith. But the moment you're starting to cut a hole through the ceiling to lower your friend in the presence of Jesus, all of a sudden, that looks a lot like faith. I think to myself as I read this story, Don, is your faith coming above the surface? I, I, I've got the absolute conviction, but how often does it come above the surface where the actions flowing out of my faith would be visible? Where Jesus, if he was looking at how I lived, would say, Oh, there it is. I see faith. For me, it's one of the challenges and one of the instructions of this passage. I'm certain faith is supposed to come above the waterline. Jesus sees it in these men. I hope he sees it in me. Then the second thing is Jesus saying something. And... and He's the first one to speak. I've already pointed that out. He, he's the first one to say anything about the situation. That, that in and of itself is a little bit puzzling because so much has been going on. But Jesus speaks and here's what he says. He says, you're crazy. What are you doing lowering a guy down through? No. Here's what he says. Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. That little statement is going to become the massive moment of this story. Take heart, my son. Let's deal with that part first, and then we'll deal with the second part. Because, because even the first part is pretty spectacular. Take heart, my son. Uh, now, he uses, he uses the word, the word take heart, it's probably actually better if we're to translate it something like don't fear, uh, rather than take heart, although you can see how take heart kind of fits. Uh, but there's two ways Jesus could have said don't fear. The first way is the, the way that I tend to think about me and my own fears. So every once in a while I tell stories. You all know I'm afraid of bats and heights. And so, you know, bats at great heights or bats carrying me to great heights. I mean, that would be horrific, a big bat carrying me up. Um, I've thought of all these scenarios. Uh, and, and I can't seem to quite get over these fears. Um, so every once in a while, though, in my life, I've been countered by them. I've got to climb a ladder. Or, you know, once when we were in Ontario, there was a bat that got into the church, and all the ladies were in the Sunday school thing, and they were like, could you come and get rid of the bat? And I'm like, oh, 
great. I mean, they were less afraid than me, and I was like a broom and a dustpan doing this, right? The, the not fearing is sort of the grit your teeth and just do it anyway. You've got to get to the top of the ladder. You've got to do that thing up high. You've got to get the bat out. And it's not that it, there's nothing to f- fear, that the thing is right there in front of me. The, the don't fear is just suck it up, do it anyway. That's one way you could not fear. The second way you could not fear is the kind of don't fear that probably maybe if you raised kids, you you said at one point to your kids when they called you at night and said, Mom, there's something in my closet. Or Dad, I think there's something under my bed. And you look and you go, don't fear. Now what do we mean? It's like, just grit your teeth, suck it up and go back to sleep. No, that's not what we mean. What we mean is there's nothing under the bed. There's nothing in the closet. There's nothing to fear. See how there's two different ways of doing that? Both the same word, both don't fear, but radically different meanings. What do you think Jesus said to this man when he came to him and said, don't fear? I won't make you think for too long. It's the second. He's saying to him, don't, it's not just about gritting your teeth and trying to gut it out and I know life is tough, but just keep going. He comes to him and says, Little child, there's nothing to fear. Now, the reason there's nothing to fear, I think, is because of what he's about to say next. Your sins are forgiven. Now that is massive. Let me give you a little bit of what I think is going on at this moment. You see, they had a, a very different understanding about sickness and sin in this day and age. Um, It went a little bit like this, that if you were sick, it was because you or perhaps someone you were closely associated with had sinned. And so you kind of brought it on yourself. And if you would stop sinning or if the other person would stop sinning, presumably you would be well. Now, in the grand scheme of things, let me be really, really careful with this. In the grand scheme of things, is there a connection between sickness and sin? Yes. I go back to Genesis. I see that because of the sin of humanity, the world is not how it's meant to be. That's a huge difference from saying that individual sickness is connected to individual sin. Now, not at me if that makes sense, because if I don't make sense on this one, I'm going to loop again, because I don't want anyone walking out of this room going, the pastor told me if I sick, I've sinned, because that's not what's going on. But, but if you think through the gospel stories, you see this start emerge in places like John chapter 9. There's a man blind, and the disciples of Jesus, these are followers of Jesus, see the man, and what do they say to Jesus? Who sinned? Is it him or his parents? You hear what they're getting at? They've made the direct connection, going, he's ill, something's wrong, either he sinned or his parents parents sinned, or maybe it's a brother or something, but someone sinned, and what does Jesus say? That's not the case at all, and he goes on and teaches something different. Now, that's not new. You see that all back through the pages of Scripture. It's a misunderstanding. You see it in the story of Job. His, his friends, his good buddies come. They, they try to comfort him because life is going so badly for Job. They, they get it right for seven days. They just sit with him. That's actually great modeling. If you have someone going through hard things, just go be with them. Their problem is when they open their mouths, actually, because what do they say? They say, Job, you must have really messed up. Like, you must have really sinned. Because look at your life. It's a mess. And Job's trying to say, hold on a second. No, I, I didn't. That's the strange thing. And the story teaches us that that's not how God works. But, but these people would have all believed it. This poor guy lowered down on the mat. Everyone would have looked and probably thought to themselves, they might not have said it to him, clearly he deserved it. Clearly he's done something because that's a pretty bad spot to be in. He must have sinned. Someone must have sinned badly. And he would have lived his whole life with that stigma. Until Jesus opens his mouth and says, Your sins are forgiven. Now, before we move on to what Jesus knew, I I just want to make sure we are appropriately troubled by that. Because I don't suspect we are. Like I I kind of grew up going to church. 
I've known the gospel. I know the story of Jesus' forgiveness. It's just been a part of my whole life. And when I read this story, I, I actually have to stop and go, hold on a second. There is something difficult about this. There's a good side, yes. I mean, I am very glad there's forgiveness in Jesus. But let's just make sure we understand the, the troubling aspect of this. Jesus just forgives a man. We don't know what he's done. He could have done some pretty horrific things to people. And Jesus just wipes it clear. Does that not trouble you just a little bit? I mean, if, if, if you come to me and steal $5, and then you, you come back later and you say, Don, I'm sorry, I'm really, really sorry. I stole 5 bucks. Would you forgive me? And I say, yes, I forgive you. Can I have my five bucks back? But yes, I forgive you. Well, you go, well that, that's kind of how it works. The person offended should be the person extending forgiveness. Now, if someone came to you and stole five dollars from you, later came to me and said, hey, would you forgive me for stealing five bucks from that other person? If I said, oh yeah, no problem, I forgive you, you would probably rightly go, hold on a second. Something's not quite right. You should be going to the person who was offended. You start to see the problems of this because when Jesus says, Son, your sins are forgiven, presumably that means that this man has done things to all sorts of other people and Jesus has just chosen to forgive them all. Remember reading, for me, I think the classic example of this back in the book of Samuel when David sins. Remember David, the man who Scripture describes as the man after God's own heart, but, but he, he wasn't altogether consistently a good upright man, was he? In fact, his, his low moment comes at a time where he lusts after a woman, he commits adultery with her, and then in an attempt to cover it up, he, he launches a plot to have her husband killed. I'd say murdered. Nathan, a prophet of God, comes to David, and here's what he says. 2 Samuel 12, 9. He asks him this question. Why have you despised the word of the Lord? Another place, it records it this way. Why have you despised the Lord? Now, yes, you've sinned against Uriah. You've had him murdered in Bathsheba, what you've done, and all their family and everyone connected. But you've sinned against the Lord. Now, here's David's response in verse 13. David says, you're right, I've sinned. And he's done trying to hide it. He's done trying to cover it up. Presumably for the first moment, the full weight of what he's done begins to sink in. What do you think ought to come next? <laughs> I mean, I think punishment, something bad happening to David to write the thing. Instead, here's what, da here's what Nathan says next on behalf of God. The Lord has put away your sins. This should trouble us a little bit. If we understand this story, this should... Because you just put yourself in the spot of Uriah's mom for a minute. Or Bathsheba's dad, okay? And now think how this feels. You're a little boy who you raised to become a great military hero. Sent into a spot where he was knowingly going to be killed. And the man who did it all you're just forgiven. God just took it all away. Your little girl who you raised who loved this man. Life just blowing to bits. You're forgiven. You see why forgiveness is such a massive, difficult thing? Now the New Testament is going to answer the difficulty for us. The New Testament does not back down from this. Don't ever feel like you have a faith that you have to avoid these kind of difficult things because the New Testament comes along in places like 1 John 1 chapter, sorry, chapter 1 verse 9 and says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he's just to forgive them. What's the justice part? The justice part is, yes, David was forgiven and someone paid for every last sin. It didn't go unpunished. It just wasn't David. It was Jesus. And the man in Matthew chapter 9, who has presumably had a whole life of sin, 
didn't just get off scot-free. It's not a matter that all those sins just get thrown away like nothing. Someone pays for those sins. And his name is Jesus. And the fact that I'm forgiven, and hopefully through faith in Christ you're forgiven, doesn't mean the sins just got thrown away casually like they didn't matter. Every last punishment for every last one was paid by Jesus. Because that's what justice demands. Now you see why this is such a massive thing. In saying, son, your sins are forgiven, Jesus is saying essentially, and the reason they're forgiven is because I'm going to go to a cross and all the punishment and all the wrath that should have been poured out on you is instead going to be poured out on me. Now, that's the thing he says. Now here's the thing he knows because something's going on in the scene. There's some people thinking some things and here's what they're thinking. They're thinking this man is blaspheming in verse 3. It's the scribes, it's the religious leaders. They hear what he says and they understand it perfectly well. They know that no human can just forgive sins. It doesn't work that way. They're looking, they're hearing, they're going... Jesus, you've now entered into territory that belongs to God and God alone. No man just gets to forgive the sins of other people. And so they reach the only reasonable conclusion they can, other than the fact that Jesus is God, they reach this conclusion, you are a man who's posing as God, that's blasphemy. They don't say it out loud, they just think it. It's one of the amazing things of Jesus. He knows thoughts. He knows what's going on in our hearts. You go read John chapter 2. He knows every thought and every affection of our heart. What amazes me about him is not that he just knows all that, but he knows all that and still died for us. That's the amazing part. He knows all that. He knows what they've said. And so he's going to respond. And so here we are now to what he's going to ask. So he's going to ask a question in response to the thoughts that are going on in their hearts. You're following how this is going on? It's getting kind of tricky now. He's seen something. He said something. They've thought something. Now he's going to ask a question in direct response to the thought that just went through their minds. And here it is. Why do you think evil in your hearts? Then this. For which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk? It's a good question, isn't it? Have you ever just thought of it just as a question? Which is easier? There's only a few options. Either one of them is easier than the other, or they are both equally easy, or they're both equally hard. Well, let me just take away one right off the top. They're not both equally easy. And that one's pretty clear. Some people have suggested maybe it's sort of a trick question Jesus asked, that, that there's actually not an answer, that, that his point is they are both equally difficult. And surely there are some things to commend that. I mean, certainly to say to someone, get up and walk, that's pretty hard. I don't have the ability, and I'm guessing you don't either. It's a hard thing. And to say to someone, your sins are forgiven, knowing what the cost of forgiveness is going to be, that's a huge, massive thing. Because it's going to cost Jesus his life. That's possible that, that we just are now running into two things that with men are impossible, but with God possible. The other option is to say, well, there's one that's easier than the other. Perhaps the one he's, he's wanting to point out that that's actually easier is to say, you know, that it's easier somehow to say, get up and walk. Because to forgive sins, as I mentioned, is such a hard thing. It would require the life of the Son of God. But to heal someone, well, Maybe that's a lesser thing. But I don't think that's the answer. Because he didn't say which is easier to do. I mean, if the question was, which is easier to do, to forgive sins or to say to get up and walk, well then definitely the answer is, it's way easier to heal someone than to die for the sins of the world. But look very closely at the question. Which is easier to say? Well, now we have a whole different question altogether, don't we? Because it's really easy to say, your sins are forgiven. Because no one could test it. I mean, how would you ever prove that I didn't have the ability to forgive sins? If I said, hey, good news, I've just forgiven all your sins. And when you die and stand before God, you've got nothing to worry about. Now, you would rightly be extremely skeptical. But there's really no way to prove that, is there? 
until we die and stand before God and you say, well, Don told me that he had forgiven her sins, in which case you are all going to be condemned before God because I don't have that ability. Only Jesus. But it's really easy to say because you can't test it. On the other hand, if there was someone who's paralyzed that, that was standing in front of me and I said, rise, get up and walk, in the next five seconds, you can put that to the test, can't you? Because if that person doesn't get up and walk, you know I am a fraud. Jesus said, which is easier to say? Well, clearly it's a lot easier to say your sins are forgiven. But look what he does next in verse 6. That you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your mat and go home. In other words, he said it's, it's harder to say, rise, get up. But just so you know, I can do that, and I can do the other, I'll do it right in front of you. And, and I don't know, if you, if you ever studied sort of logic, or certainly in Greek thought, even in Hebrew thought, this is called an a fortiori argument, meaning if you can do the harder thing, you can do the lesser thing. So for me, the classic example, if you ever watched the Life commercials when I was a kid, Mikey Likes It. Anyone seen those? Remember, Mikey Likes It. It's a very puzzling marketing campaign where you're trying to sell your cereal on the fact that people probably won't like it. But Mikey, who in the commercial seemingly is the picky person, becomes the test case, right? So here's the logic of the advertising. If Mikey, who is extremely picky, eats it, then probably the rest of us will like it. I still to this day don't understand why they did that, but that's how they sold their cereal. Mikey likes it, meaning that's the greater difficulty, so the rest of us will like it, that's the lesser difficulty. Jesus says, here's the harder thing. The hardest thing is to say to this man, get up and walk, that's the harder thing. Therefore, I could say the easier thing, which is, son, your sins are forgiven. Now what happens in the next five seconds? Because the next five seconds will tell us if he has the authority to do any of it. Verse seven, simple one sentence verse. If you're looking for something to memorize this week, this might be an interesting one to memorize. And just ponder. Here it is. And he rose and went home. I mean, just as a statement, it's sort of the most sort of bland thing. I mean, if you separate it out from the story, it's like, well, tomorrow I'll get up and go home too at the end of the day. We'll do that all week long. You'll get up in a few minutes from church and you'll go home. But I understand what's happening in this story. When this man got up and went home, it meant Jesus could do the hard thing. And it means he can forgive his sins. There's only one thing left. It's the reaction of the people involved in the story. We already know the paralyzed man, he's, he's gone home. The, the Pharisees, they're presumably still upset because they're going to continue to plot of how they can end Jesus' life. They'll just keep building more and more ammunition until they can actually get to the point where they will con you know, accuse him of a whole bunch of things falsely and end his life. But what about the crowd? We're told this in verse 8. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. Now it's a bit of a confused reaction. Here's what they get right. They get right that God is, God is involved in this moment. The, the word fear, the description there is, is that sense of awe and trembling that you would have if you entered into the presence of God. I guarantee it, because everyone who ever did in Scripture had that same experience. It's the way the early church functioned. You can look at places like Acts chapter 9. They just lived in this constant sense of awe and trembling at God. All through the rest of the New Testament, we're going to be told that our motivation to live in a way that pleases and honors Christ is going to hinge on this sense of awe and wondered who God is. Whether it's the pursuit of holiness, or whether it's evangelism in places like Corinthians chapter 5, whether it's in terms of how we were going to relate in marriage in Ephesians chapter 5, on and on it goes. All those places, it keeps coming back to the sense of reverence and awe of who Jesus is as the Son of God. Now this crowd gets partly there, right? They know God's shown up. They have this sense of awe. They just don't connect the dots. They're amazed. God's shown up and God has given an amazing authority to men. The thing that they don't realize is that the man standing before him named Jesus is God. 
Like they've gotten so close. They're halfway there. God's here. He's got great authority. So the God of great authority must have given it to this man. Now, I'm not imagining that the man in that room who just said your son's sins are forgiven is God come in flesh. Now, I think there's two, two applications. Well, there's probably lots, but two that I would invite you to consider with me. The first for, for those of us who, who would claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. The second for those who, who aren't there yet. But we're hoping the fact that you're here this morning means that you're considering it. So first for those who are followers of Jesus, because you might be sitting here going, well, this is all great. I, I already, you know, invited Jesus in my heart when I was five. It's been 30 years or 40 years or 50 years or eight years, whatever it's been. So I'm really, really thankful for this forgiveness. This is excellent. But that's kind of the past. I'm on to other stuff. What about all these other issues in my life? Where's God now? What's going to happen here? What about this trial? What about this difficulty? I'm thankful for forgiveness. But what does that have to do with now? In Romans chapter 8, Paul is writing to a group of Christians, followers of Jesus, who are going through horrific trial. Uh, it's this group of Christians who are on the verge, if not already seeing it, of living through a time when they will give their lives for following Jesus. And you pick it up in the words Paul uses. He talks to them about the fact that he knows that they are living in weakness. In fact, it's this passage where Paul talks to these group of people and he says, I know there's even going to be times where you go to pray and you're not even going to have the words. All you're going to have is just groans. That's how hard it's going to be. I won't even ask if you've ever been there or are there now. Because I know pretty much every one of us would put up our hands. Or you're just at the end. In verse 32... Paul says this, speaking to these people in the middle of that kind of pressure and trial, if God gave up his son for us, let me just pause for a second. What he's saying is, if God sent his son to die on a cross so that we could be forgiven, everything we've talked about in Matthew chapter 9, if God did that, then will he not also give us all things? Meaning, if he did that there, do you think he would have done that for you? To abandon you now. Impossible. You hear the logic? It's the same a fortiori argument. It's he's done the greater thing, so he will do the lesser thing. And I don't mean to trivialize your difficulties or the trial you're going through, but let me guarantee you the hardest issue was the forgiveness of your sins. And if Jesus took care of that, he'll take care of you now. That's the message for believers. That's when you read Matthew chapter 9. That's what I hope you see. Is Jesus forgave this man. He has forgiven me. He won't abandon me. Ever. But what if you don't yet know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Well, I want to read you something. There's always a danger with reading kind of long quotes. So let me alert you to the dangers that you can try particularly hard to pay attention. It's just harder, I find, to listen to things being read than just me up here chatting. But this one's good. This one's worth reading. It's a C.S. Lewis quote. He's written some great things, some other things that are a little less great, but here's, here's what it's called. It's, it's the title of a brochure he wrote. It's called, What Are We to Make of Jesus? Isn't that great? It's simple. It's like, what are we to make of Jesus? Here's what he says. What are we to make of Jesus? This is a question which has, in a sense, a frantically comic side for the real question is not what we're going to make of Christ, but what's he going to make of us? The picture of a fly sitting deciding what to make of an, element, of an elephant sorry, has a comic element about it. But perhaps the questioner meant, what are we to make of him in the sense of how are we to solve the historical problem set by the record of his sayings and his actions? The problem is to reconcile two things. On the one hand, you have got almost universally admitted depth of sanity of his moral teaching, which is not questioned even by those opposed to Christianity. In fact, I find when I'm arguing with anti-God people that they rather make a point of saying, I'm entirely in favor of the moral teaching of Christianity. And there seems to be a general agreement that in the teaching of this man and his followers, moral truth is exhibited at its purest and best, full of wisdom. 
the whole thing, realistic, fresh to the highest degree, the product of a sane mind. That's one phenomenon. Let me stop there. So you hear what he's saying? So everything Jesus teaches is so brilliant. Like nothing the world has heard or seen before. Now, he goes on. But that claim, in fact, doesn't... Sorry, the other phenomenon is quite the appalling nature of the man's theological remarks. You all know what I mean. And I want to stress the point that the appalling claim which this man seems to be making is not merely made at one moment of his career. There is, of course, the moment which led to his execution. The moment he said to the high priest, in answer to the question, Who are you? I am the anointed the son of the uncreated God, and you will see me appearing at the end of all history as the judge of the universe. But that claim, in fact, does not rest on one dramatic moment. When you look to his conversation, you'll find this sort of thing running through the whole thing. For instance, he went about saying to people, I forgive your sins. Then there's the curious thing that seems to slip out almost by accident. On one occasion, this man is sitting down, looking at Jerusalem from the hill above it, and suddenly out comes this extraordinary remark, I keep sending you prophets and wise men. No one comments on it, and yet quite suddenly, almost incidentally, he is claiming to be the power that through all centuries sent wise men and prophets into the world. What can we make of Jesus? There's no question of what we can make of him. It's an entirely in a question of what he intends to make of us. You must either accept or reject the whole story. If you have yet to accept, not just the Jesus, the great teacher, but Jesus, the one who died for your sins, I can't implore you and beg you enough to do that this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ the worker of miracles, the teacher of incredible wisdom, and the savior of mankind because he laid down his life. Father, thank you that he also can be the Lord of our lives. And Father, we thank you that you have made it for us such a simple thing to become your children. That it comes simply through admitting and acknowledging that our best efforts and best attempts have fallen short and there is nothing we can do to live right and well enough to please you. Father, we thank you that in place of that, you ask us simply to believe that Jesus was enough, that his death on the cross was for us, that the forgiveness he purchased applies to me. Father, help us to live with the courage and the confidence and the conviction of what we see in Matthew 9, so that our faith will break that watermark. The people would see us and they will know that we live differently because of the convictions that are so true. Father, help us as well to apply the truth of your forgiveness to the rest of our lives, that we would be people who know that if you have done that great thing for us, you will not withhold your care for tomorrow. We thank you and we love you in Christ's name. Amen.